Hey Book Talk and welcome to the series of our author interviews with My Next Live. This is going to be with Emily Fluke, who's the author of Death of a Fairy Tale. It's kind of like a cross between Supernatural Wants and the Grim Fairy Tales. It looks amazing. Um, so I'm just going to invite Emily in now and we will chat author journeys and all of that kind of stuff. There she is. Boom, boom, boom. Drum roll, please. Hopefully she'll find me. Emily, Emily. Oh, Emily has declined my invite. There we go. <laughs> right, I'm sorry if I got the time wrong. So, no, I, um, I feel you, I was confused. Maths. I'm an author, it's fine. Uh, we don't do maths, so. Um, but thank you for joining me. Um, so I just wanted to, I was just introducing you and I was saying, this is Emily, is it Fluke? Do you say Fluke is your last name? Or, yeah? Uh, author yeah, so of my... Fairy... Go on. Go ahead. I was going to say, author of Death of a Fairy Tale. I started reading. It looks absolutely amazing. It's got all the elements of the shows that I love. Um, absolutely. So, first things first, where are you and how are you? Um, I'm great. I'm in California and it's very hot today. So, that's not wonderful okay. because I want it to still be... I'm the kind of a person who wishes it would rain all the time, and I'm in the state that doesn't ever rain, so it's awful. Which but um, I'm pretty... yeah, I mean, I mean, I used to live in California, but I'm in the UK, so we should just swap places because, yeah, it, it it rains here. <laughs> I miss California. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, it's bright and, and sunny here. Us, when... I've already oh, got a sunburn. Amazing. Oh my God. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I don't miss that actually. Although you can get sunburns here. The problem with England is that we do get temperatures over 90 degrees, but there's no air conditioning. No one has air conditioning. The only places that have air conditionings are offices. Um, so when it is hot, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to get away from it. So we're not built for it. Um, yeah, we need, we need, we have lots of fans and, we're, we're putting a pool in the garden, so at least we'll have that this summer. So, yeah, but it's not fun. Yeah. So tell me how long you've been on BookTok and how you discovered it. Okay, so I have been on BookTok since September of last year. So not too long. And yeah. I discovered it through my writing group, which, so um, about actually a year ago, I went on a Facebook group and I said, Hey, I'm looking for a writing partner, just somebody that I could like text throughout today. And we could talk about writing. It blew up. The post blew up and I ended up creating a writing group. And we have now been meeting every week consistently since then. It's been about a year and a few months into it, they were really pushing me saying, you need to get on TikTok. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. And so finally, I was like, I don't, you know, I was just like everybody else that doesn't understand it. I was like, well, what? I'm not going to do dancing like a teenager. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I procrastinated it. And then I finally got it, I think, in September. And then I didn't even post anything maybe until October. And then I and then, yeah, it just kind of took off. Now I was like, oh, actually, this is my most favorite social media platform now. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, I'm everywhere. And Twitter was really in my home for making author friends and stuff like that I've met most of my close author friends on Twitter but um TikTok is definitely my happy place I, I I spend so much more time on TikTok than I do anywhere else and I think you need to pick one that you spend most of your time on um and do it well you know and then the others kind of take a back seat but yeah it's so much fun um I, and like you I was like really TikTok and it was something my son did and scrolled through ridiculously just stupid videos. I was like, really? And then I thought, no, there's got to be books on there somewhere. So off I went to investigate. And lo and behold, there are. Isn't it exciting? Oh, fantastic. So tell us a little bit about Death of a Fairy Tale. Can you give us your elevator pitch? Okay, so one of my favorite elevator pitches is that it's the Dresden Files, except for moms and fairy tale fans. But if you don't know Dresden Files, then it's Supernatural plus Once Upon a Time meets yeah. uh, Castle. So, yeah, I love all of those things. So, yeah, I just, and the cover, I mean, who designed your cover? It's gorgeous. 
Um, yeah, actually, I ordered that from a website and they designed it and I have ordered other covers from them and they're kind of hit and miss. But this one just I sent in some mystery covers as inspiration for them to use. So mm -hmm. I can show you actually I should I should do a video talking about the cover that inspired this one. Yeah. And this one is actually designed to sit on a mystery shelf, which is interesting because at Barnes and Noble, if you go into Barnes and Noble, they have it under fantasy which I understand. I mean, it is it urban fantasy, but yeah. I now wonder about the design of the cover because it looks great, but it looks like a mystery too. It does. I'm looking, I've got it open on my laptop. So I'm like, it does. Yeah. But it's got, you know, that hint of Red Riding Hood, the wolf, you know, so there's definitely those fantasy vibes about it. Um, and that's what I zeroed in on, I think, because yeah that that's just what what i saw first um but i think it looks great but so many books can be shelved in different places i mean i have one that could be sci-fi or it could be dystopian you know and john green i know some of his books go into the young adult sometimes they go into the adult you know it just kind of depends on the on the shop really where they decide to stick it sometimes but so this is the first in a series am i yes correct? Yep. so what can we expect from the rest of the series like how does this character's journey continue? Or do you use new characters? So this will be the same character. It's following Mari Fable through the whole thing and her newfound friend, which you, it, once you read Death of a Fairy Tale, you'll know who that is. Um, a big part of the personal thread through this is going to be her raising her child. And each book will be dealing with a different phase of parenthood and the struggles of that phase of parenthood. So the first book obviously is having a newborn and that struggle, all the struggles that come with that. Um, I just finished writing the second book, which is called Kidnapping the Classics. And oh, that one, it. that one's set about a year and a half after Death of a Fairy Tale. So she has a toddler now and now it's dealing with the toddler struggles. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, so that's a huge thread for her personal journey. And then the fairy tales themselves, it will be a different or multiple different fairy tales for each book that she will be dealing with. Yeah. So in kidnapping the classics, um, the main fairy tale of that is part of the mystery. So I won't spoil that, but one of the big other stories is actually Frankenstein. So not a fairy tale, but a classic story. Love it. And then a bunch of other fairy tales are mentioned in it as well. And then the book three, which I'm plotting right now as I finish editing kidnapping the classics, that comes out in July. That's called the Pinocchio Project. So clearly it will be based around Pinocchio. I love it. I love how you have brought Frankenstein into, you know, and I assume you've watched the entire of once the, how many seasons are there? Quite a few. But how they yeah. took some of the lesser known fairy tales and, you know, put in things like, you know, Peter Pan for me wasn't necessarily a fairy tale in the same way that Cinderella and Snow White was, but the way they blended all that and what you're doing by taking and throwing Frankenstein at it, but also this parent child relationship. I think I've not seen this done before in urban fantasy or mystery. And I think having that obstacle um, that obviously she's the mother's going to have to deal with while she's battling all these other things, but also the opportunity to show how wonderful those relationships can be as well as hard, I think is a, is a fantastic way to look at that mother role and what it means and how we do how are we going to define that uh ongoing so totally hats off to you i think it's an incredible way to to address all those things um and i'm assuming this will be based on some of your own experiences and how tough raising how many do you have two two yeah yeah so yeah <laughs> i feel that yeah it's hard it's hard i mean i write young adults so i never have to put babies in line but um I love, I love that you're approaching it this way. And will you be stopping at three or will we be expecting more? So this is originally plotted out for 11 books. Um, I wanted it to be long because I really wanted to take the Dresden Files. Dresden Files is one of my favorite series. Um, it's about a, a, it's very similar. So mysteries, but magic too. And I wanted it to be one directed toward moms. So I really wanted it to be a lot of books that you could read and you follow the phases. And basically it will end with her daughter going off to college. So it needs to be long to get there. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I haven't decided if I'm fully going to go all the way through or if I'm going to stop at five books or not. So we're going to, we'll see. Yeah. Oh, and have you kind of thought about which fairy tales you might be using for all of those 11 books? Yeah. You've got that yeah. kind of all, yeah. all around Japan. I love it. I love it. I love it when you already know how long it's going to be. <clears throat> when I wrote my trilogy, I started it as just one book. And when I got to the end of it, I thought there's more, there's more to this story. Um, so I had to go back and then foreshadow things and, you know, add things in and stuff like that. But I think it's great. And, you know, readers that fall in love with it and you can give them such a long series just to read through is, is going to be so much fun. Um, oh, you've got me suckered in, that's for sure. So do you, have you been working on anything else or is this your big baby or are, are there other things out there? So this is actually my big question. And as an author, I'm going to ask this to you as well. I just started my indie author career. I've been writing books for a long time and I really wanted to go into traditional, but I never got around to really querying. So I have a lot of books that are written and done that are just sitting around. Yeah. And when I started my writing group, I saw the other authors just having so much fun going indie. So I kind of pivoted and instead of diving into querying, I just started publishing. Mm -hmm. And so, so my first one is Death of a Fairy Tale that's indie published. And now I'm just so excited about it that I have so many ideas, but I'm a little concerned that maybe I have too many because I will be putting out four, the first four books of the Mari Fable mysteries this year. But I also want to do the start of a duology, which is a Snow White retelling for young adults, mm -hmm. high fantasy. Um, that one's already written. It just needs to be rewritten to fit into a duology rather than a standalone. So yeah. I want to put out that one this year. And then I also have a series called the Gutted Grim series, which the first book is written for that as well. And it is a thriller version of fairy tales. So very dark. Um, I, love I love it. And they're all fairy tales, but they're all also very different genres because one yeah. is high fantasy, you know, Mari Fable Mysteries is lighthearted mystery. And then we've got thriller fairy tales. So I think, I think you're fine. I think because you are all within the retelling area, um, even if one was young adult and one, you know, one is adult, I, I think you're fine because your voice is the same and we can, we'll know to expect a retelling from you. I don't think the rest of it matters. And I think that is the beauty of indie publishing is that you don't have those gates um, constraining you, you know, so you can, you can go and do that. You don't have to make a new pen name for it because it will be your voice, your style, and what we will come to expect from you from your book so and there will be you know 75 percent of people that read young adult are actually adults over the age of 25 so people that read your young adult will be looking at your adult and vice versa um so you know so i think that's fantastic yay go do it charge on <laughs> but i think obviously you know depending on where you decide to release your other books outside of the the 11 book series you don't want to pe keep you away from too long. Um, so that will be timing that you'll have to juggle, but you sound like you're quite productive and on top of it. So I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can do it. I yeah. hope so. So my, my yeah. plan is with my young adult retelling is I'll just, it's just a duology. So I'll do one book in May of this year and then the next book will come out exactly a year later. So I know that's yeah. a little long yeah. for indie publishing, but it's just a duology. It's not a full series. Yeah. And then my thrillers, I planning to publish every year around Halloween. So I'll just oh, yeah. do one of those yeah. for Halloween every year. Yeah. And then I'll get, you know, three or four Mari Fable Mysteries out in between yeah. all those. I think that sounds really smart. Um, really good. Yeah. I think you should be excited. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And I think the Halloween thing is perfect. Are the thrillers connected or are they standalones? So those will be like very vaguely connected, like the character's story will end at the end of that book, but you'll see them pop up as a side character in the next book. Right. I love that. I love it. And I love it when you get to see like that character through someone else's eyes, you know, and you just, you learn new things about them that way. I think it's a really fun thing to do. So, so how did you first get into writing? Um, well, so when I was about 11 years old, I wrote a terribly plagiarized version of Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> I think we've all done that, haven't we? The, yeah, the plagiarism part. Yeah. I used to love all of the Jane Austen. Like, I, I wasn't even reading them 
until a little bit later, but I would watch the movies with my mom and I just was obsessed with them and I wanted to write them. And then a little bit later, I watched Lord of the Rings and went back and read it. And I was like, okay, now I love fantasy. Yes. So I've been writing pretty much a long time, but during high school and college, of course, just too busy. You don't write, you, you're too busy with school. So I think it wasn't really until I slowed, had to slow down because I had my daughter mm-hmm. and I jump started with NaNoWriMo again and wrote just a terribly written middle grade fantasy portal fantasy that will never see the light of day, but it was fun to write. And from there, I've just been wanting to write every year. So yeah, I've been on it for the past that's, six that's years. Fantastic. My daughter is six now. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And as they get older, it gets a bit easier and they're a little bit more independent and you can kind of do a sprint while they're watching TV or doing something, you know, um, and that's quite helpful. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I love, I love that, that, yeah, you've found your way back into it. And I think we've all got those books that we've shoved in a drawer that are our way we're teaching ourselves how to write or get back into it or, you know, and I still have one that I keep thinking, I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to get back to it. You know, I don't know if I will, but I love the idea still. So maybe who knows, but yeah. So is your favorite genres to read also fantasy and thriller and mystery and things like that? Yeah. And do you have yep. a favorite a favorite book? I know it's a really hard question, but or something that you loved in your teens or before that? Um, so more recently, my favorite book is Lost Boy by Christina Henry. Mm-hmm. It is a very dark Peter Pan retelling. Yeah. And it's just it's very thriller paced, but it's also, it's kind of like Lord of the Flies meets Peter Pan, basically. <laughs> and yeah. I don't know, I just I've couldn't seen it. put I haven't it down. Read it yet. Yeah, so yeah, it does look good. It looks like my thing. Yeah. Is that, is it young adult? Yeah. Actually, yeah, I thought it, I on, thought it if you, if you go into Barnes and Noble or some other bookstores or whatever, they have it on the adult bookshelf, but I think it is right. originally supposed to be young adult. Yeah. No, I need to check that out. It looks it looks good though. I've seen people talking about it. And you know, book talk really does influence you to buy things because when you see people talking about things again and again and again, it, you definitely get the FOMO and you think, you know, but there are books that I've then gone on to look up and gone, actually, that's not for me. It's not, it might be all over book talk, but it's not, I know it's not the kind of thing that I want to read. So, um, so I don't, you know, I, I resist. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Um, so how do you approach your writing process? Are you so you mentioned the plotting. So what what is that? What do you do? Yeah. My watch going off. Yeah, what do you do to plot your books out? Um, so now I'm using Save the Cat, which I never did before, but I really enjoyed I didn't do that for Death of a Fairy Tale, but I did it for book two, Kidnapping the Classics, and I'm really liking it. I used to plot out yeah. chapter by chapter. And I think it got a little, a little harder to see the structure that way. So I'd like now that I'm using yeah. something that's a concrete structure. So I do a really detailed plot and I consider or outline and I consider my outline kind of to be draft one. And then when I get to my first draft, I go very, not necessarily slowly, but very, very, very carefully. And I use all of my brain power for that first draft so that I don't have to do a lot of editing. And then when I do go back and edit, it's just whatever changes I need to make based on what beta readers have said mm-hmm. and clarifications. And then of course, line and proofreading and stuff. Yeah. And do you use a professional editor for your edits or is that something that you use friends and critique partners and things like that to find all those things? So far, I've only been doing the second. I've been using um, critique partners and stuff because I'm just so new to indie. But I definitely will be hiring a professional editor for my young adult fantasy that is going to be in May. Because I think with the Mari Fables series, I kind of talked to like my critique group and my writers group about it. And they said, you know, Mari has such a strong, like offbeat voice that I can kind of get away with editing it myself and having the critique group edit it rather than a professional editor but it's definitely not something I want to rely on as I go forward I want to be hiring professional yeah and I always find you know I I like you I use editors for some books and not for others depending on how much feedback I've had and the the quality of that feedback um 
but you learn something from everybody that reads it and gives you that feedback and when you have a professional do that the, the experience is is it's amazing i mean it puts you out of your comfort zone because there might be things flagged that you hadn't thought of or you don't want to change but that whole process helps you grow as an author and i you know i would highly recommend where people can afford it because obviously it's not cheap um being able to do that and forming writers groups and getting beta readers and all of that kind of stuff it's it's really valuable i have a critique partner who is really good at pointing out exactly what needs to change whether it's a character problem or a big structure problem, whatever it is um and that for me i find the hardest is making those big picture changes without advice because i second guess myself um what do you find the hardest part of the whole process um well that second draft that i do after outline is definitely the hardest for me because i want to go very carefully with it but then it is i was actually just talking to another writer on here before you got on and we found out we were very similar in that we do a very detailed outline and then we write linearly in our first draft yeah and it's hard sometimes to take big picture things like you were talking about. If there's something big that needs to change in the structure um, that has been mentioned by a critique reader or a beta reader and you agree that needs to change, that is definitely hard for me because it's just, I since I write so linearly, everything is so yeah. stacked on, a, yeah. if I try to add something in or take it out, yeah. I feel like the whole thing just is gonna come crumbling down <laughs> and it needs yeah. a big yeah. rewrite. I feel exactly the same way and I approach it the same way because I also write literally, I can't, I have to feel my way into each scene, each chapter. And although I'm a, you know, an extensive plotter, there are things that change and there are things you learn about the characters as I go on that I didn't necessarily know. And I, so I have to do that in a chronological order because when you get to that end scene, it's the sum of all those things that they've been through that makes that scene work. So when you do have to change things around, I do, I just, I'm just like, um, it is hard. It's like having a jigsaw puzzle with no shapes that they're all just squares, you know, and you're like, where do I do that? You know, um, but also having somebody say, you need to do that, which is why I have an agent and I, she's very editorial and I love that she will just give me these edit letters and say this, this, and this, and this, and this, because I can rely on her and trust her vision um, that I'm doing the right thing. Otherwise, I would struggle and second guess myself. And but when you have beta readers that you trust, um, that's you know that's the thing that you need to to make those changes. Once I've done those things, yeah, it's much easier. I think once I've got all that into place, and then I can fine tune all the other bits and character and and stuff like that. Yeah. And which part do you enjoy the most? Probably outlining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because. That's still like the most creative part where, well, actually, no, I really do enjoy drafting too, especially with a voice like my, with Mari Fable's voice, because it's just so quirky and fun to write the dialogue and her inner thoughts. So yeah, it just depends, but I really do enjoy the outlining and the really, um, I actually get feedback on my outline. I put that to my writer's group and I have them try to tear apart the structure to find out if there's anything that's wrong or if there's a plot hole before I do the drafting so that I don't have to go back and make a structural change, which of course, you know, you can't always catch everything from an outline, yeah. but that's that's, that's my uh, goal. Yeah. That is a great idea. I did that once. I was pitching a book to my agent and then I wrote out, it was only a two page synopsis. It wasn't, and it wasn't, particularly polished it was just and then this happens and this happens and this happens and it was a high what it's planning to be a high uh fantasy vampire trilogy and i had werewolves in it and she said yeah lose the werewolves that's not working and i was like you know it was a really huge part of the book um but actually it made sense and i went away and thought about how to address that and instead of werewolves there are different vampire clans and it it, it puts them all off so it really, really worked. But I'm so glad I did that before I started writing it because, you know, or I was only, or I was only like a third of the way through or something um, so that I could make those changes because that would have been a huge rewrite that I wouldn't have wanted to do because, you know, it's, it's a thing writing a whole book, you know, and if you've got to tear it apart, um, it's not fun. Or you lose half a novel like I've done before with my computer crash. <laughs> yeah, that's not fun. Yeah, it was not fun. I, 
I had to put that book aside for a while before I could look at it again. Um, no. So do you think that, have you fallen in love with the indie way or do you think at some point in the future you might query an agent or pursue traditional publishing? So actually I just submitted for RevPit. I don't know if you've heard of RevPit, but it's yeah. called, yeah, Revise and Resubmit. Yeah. So um, I'm hoping- I love the editors it. with RevPit. I think they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I am excited with that because I do have, like I, like I said, I've written a bunch that are just kind of sitting around mm. and some that I definitely still want to query because there's a couple that I have that are written that I don't ever want to indie publish. And um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm still 100% interested in traditional as well yeah. and want to go that route. And I hope that's still possible because I know there are some agents that say, you know, they don't want it to to rep somebody who's already indie published because then you mm -hmm. can't then an, a publisher can't call you a debut novelist they still do um most of the publishers would still launch you as a debut because because it's your debut into the published into the traditional world so i think most of them realize that now and i think agents are coming around to that um i think there might be one or two that are very traditional and you no know, it has to be this way but i think um and i think also publishers are looking at what's doing well in the indie world not just from picking out particular authors and books but also genres and what the power of book talk and what is hitting um you know those bestseller lists which isn't always traditionally published books is a really good tool for them to understand what people actually want to read and, you know, like it annoyed me when vampires were so out of fashion and now they're coming back in. I'm thinking, I've always loved vampires. I've always read vampires. I always will read vampires. Um, and I think when you're a reader who loves a particular genre, that doesn't ever go away. You know, it's not just because the publishers say we're not doing vampires for five years. I'm like, where are my vampire books? You know? So Yeah, you're leaving the readers out of that. Exactly. Exactly. They're not so they don't I don't think publishers are good at listening to the readers. Um, but I think things are starting to change. And I think, you know, the growth of indie publishing, the growth of book talk, all of these things are starting to show publishers and agents that, you know, it's a new world. Um, and we can do this. And yeah, and it's not easy, but so many of us are embracing that path. Um, and then in the hybrid thing, like you're pursuing and that I'm pursuing, you know, when you're doing it a bit of both is, is so common. And you've got big traditional authors like Brandon Sanderson, who's now indie publishing, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a great, it, you know, it just, yeah, it's fantastic. It really adds credit to everything that we're doing. So, yeah, we'll get there. But it is slow at the moment. It's so much slower than it was before just because of COVID and everything. It's... Um, so if you do do, if you are pursuing it, just keep patient and keep writing because it's just taking a long time. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. there needs to be a better process, I think, for that whole querying, um, not just agents, but also with publishers because they have to read everything outside of their working hours. So, yeah, that's not... Yeah, I have, a, I have a thriller retelling of Hansel and Gretel that's for young adults. And it's very dark. And so I actually took it to a Futurescapes conference, which is um, offshoot as a horror thriller called Fearscapes. So I got to yeah. not pitch it to agents, but yeah. they, they helped me work on the query for it. So I, I had um, a couple of different big young adult agents look through it and they actually seemed interested. So I do want to still query that Excellent. one for sure. Right. And then I had a horror author who's published in the traditional world uh, read through it as well so that's one that I'm planning to take to traditional and I will never I would never I'm publish so that one impressed that you've done a Hansel and Gretel because it's an idea I've been playing with for a while um, but I almost want to make them the villains of the story uh, but I just bought the original Brothers Grimm because whether I do that as a retelling or not I want to take maybe one of their lesser known stories and kind of play around with it and um but I need to, yeah, I need to read it. At the moment, I'm I'm starting to plot a young adult Dracula modern day retelling. So that's the next book my agent and I have decided to uh, to do. I mean, it's quite dry. The original, I never read the original book, which surprises me because I love horror. Um, but it's very dry, and it's entirely in journal entries. 
so I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of WhatsApping and FaceTiming and in in my retelling. But I'd love a retelling. Retellings are so fun when you can invert so many things and tropes and characters and genders and all of that. It's um, oh, I'd love to read it. Hint, hint. <laughs> it's a it's. I'm a huge um. Have, have you heard of locked puzzle rooms or escape rooms? I'm a huge fan oh, of those. So that's what it is. It's Hansel and Gretel in an escape room. So. <laughs> That's cool. Wow. It's fun. It was really fun to write. Okay. How did you come up with that idea? That's that's a really cool idea. I love it. So I just I just do a lot of escape rooms and then I decided to build one in my house for my friends. And it was so fun making the puzzles, but it was also hard because I don't have like the resources to actually build like the pulley yeah. system to yeah. make the cool puzzles. But I was like, but I could write this. And since yeah. I love retellings, I figured Actually, escape rooms lend well to any retellings because you would, you know, there's so many dark re, um, fairy tales yeah. that, where they're trapped, right? Rapunzel's yeah. trapped. Uh, the queen and, or the girl in Rumpelstiltskin is trapped. I mean, there's just so many. But I took Hansel and Gretel because I wanted this brother-sister relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And they go off and find that they're trapped in this cult or this uh, yeah. escape room built by a cult. So... That's so cool. That's so cool. I'm fascinated by cults as well. I studied them when I was at university. Psychology was my undergraduate degree. And I was, I loved the whole cult concept. I just, yeah. I, wow, this sounds like an incredible book. I can see why there's interest. I hope that you continue to get that because it sounds awesome. Um, yeah. So where do you get your inspiration in general from? I mean, obviously, uh, we know you like a retelling and the fairy tales, but how do you decide where you're going to, what situation you're going to put them in, you know? I think it, uh, a lot of things is like what I'm interested in. So like with the Mari Fable mysteries, I obviously wanted to put her in the motherhood situation because I want to see a mother who's going to be kick butt and be able to fight or hunt supernatural creatures while raising her kid. So that was really easy for me because that was something I wanted to read. And then, like with this uh, Hansel and Gretel, um, I just love escape rooms. So I was like, well, I'm going to throw this into here and see what happens. So I take something that I think either I really want to read or I already really enjoy in my life, and then I put it with the retelling uh, or with a fairy tale, and then retell it. And that's fantastic. Away, um, yeah. Actually, I think you should carry on with this stuff because my agent said to me the other day that retellings are golden. Um, so I think people are actively looking for retellings so keep on that path i think i think you've i think you're on the right path um definitely and you've got great covers so you know that's working for you as well so oh so exciting i yeah i love it totally love it oh wow wow um do you put any like secrets or easter eggs in your books for people to find oh you do i love it i love there's so many people that do it's awesome <laughs> i actually did a a, uh, okay. like a contest giveaway for Death of a Fairy Tale where I told people to go find as many references, both pop culture and fairy tale and classic literature that they could possibly find. And then if they found them all, they were going to win like signed copies of book one and two and then some book yeah. swag and stuff. So yeah. it was fun. I had some That's people, great. you know, messaging me on TikTok with all the stuff they found. And <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I think I think mine are really subtle. They're probably there more for my amusement than anyone else's. I'm not sure anyone would necessarily notice. Maybe. Maybe if you read all my books in one go, but um, who knows? Who knows? Um, what do you find the most exciting thing about being a published author? Uh, hearing from readers, for sure. Like, it was just mind-blowing when I sent out... Once Death of a Fairy Tale was out there and people would like highlight passages and message me on Instagram or TikTok, or I would see people talking about it on TikTok. That was just so exciting. I was like, oh my gosh, they're reading my words and they related to it. And that has been my favorite part so far is when people reach out to me and say, oh, I went through this with my baby too. Or I remember this struggle with my newborn too. Or I, you know, and I'm like, this is exactly what I wanted. Exactly. I wanted mothers to feel seen and heard yeah. and like they could be in a fantasy adventure too, because it's always... Yeah. you know men or whatever it's not usually a mother who gets that adventure yeah absolutely absolutely I, that's what i think is so unique about your story i yeah i think that's yeah that's fantastic and was there is there anything about the process that has surprised you 
uh, that was unexpected that you, you know? Um, yeah, I think so. The process of publishing, if that's what you're meaning, I, mm -hmm. the heart, I really expected marketing to be extremely hard and that was actually coming a little bit easier to me than I thought. Um, I, I mean, I've had to push myself to reach out to Barnes and Noble and, you know, now they're stocking my book and stuff, but that those initial steps were a little scary, but they weren't as bad as I thought. Um, but what was hard was actually dealing with all the software that I have to, do. I just don't yeah. like technological things. So now I have to learn how to do all these changes to my website and, um, you know, just like formatting and stuff. It's like, I want to outsource all that, but that's also really expensive. So yeah, that part yeah. of the process. I don't like <laughs> no, it's hot. I mean, there are so many jobs within the job of being an indie author that we have to learn. And, you know, it really put me off initially when I, I published my first couple of books with small presses and because I thought I don't know how to self publish, but then going through the process with them because I was involved in every step. Um, and then one of them folded and I thought, well, I'm going to resell publish it. I know what to do now. So I kind of learned through them and that was really helpful. And that put me in a position that I could use all that knowledge and, and, and self-publish it. But I agree. It's, it's really, and it's hard knowing where to put your money and where to pull it back because what works for one author doesn't work for another. And, you know, that's quite confusing. I will say for formatting, the best thing I ever did was get the vellum software because it's so easy, so easy and intuitive. It just does it for you. Um, and then you can do as many changes as you want whenever you need to do them. And it's totally under your control. So I would highly recommend that. Um, I think that's probably the best money I've ever spent. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll look into that for sure. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think it's about somewhere between $200 and $250. But when you think about what you pay for formatting and how many books you're intending to release... It, it's totally worth it um yeah totally worth it I, I haven't looked back you know it can do the uh chapter image headings it can do the picture the grayed out picture on the first page of every, it can do so many things so it's so clever um I would yeah I would do that um have you got any advice for aspiring authors starting out on their journey I, yeah I think the biggest piece of advice I would give is to like find your tribe or find your writing group because writing is so lonely or it feels yeah. so lonely but it really does not have to be mm -hmm. and also throwing yourself into a writing group and it's got to be you got to also be okay with kind of vetting who's in your group and who you're letting read it's, you obviously don't want somebody who's just going to attack you as a person or something like that so that's a very important to make sure you're in a good group um, or you build a good group for yourself mm -hmm. But I think that's the most important thing is just having people that you can work with because whether you go indie or traditional or whatever, you're always going to have to work with other people, editors, you know, marketing, whatever it is. And that's the start of it is in a writing group and yeah. getting that feedback and building that, you know, uh, ability to get feedback, take it in the right way and then apply it to your book. I think, you know, those are the most important things, I think, but also just the friendships and having people to talk to you about writing because, you know, people that aren't writers that are in our daily lives don't understand. They just do not. And you could talk about it to them all day, which is fun, but it's not yeah. going to be as fun as talking to another writer. Absolutely. I mean, whenever I get to meet another writer in real life, it's just so exciting. You know, it, yeah, it just makes my day. And, you know, my in real life friends, I have friends that read, but they don't, they don't understand. You know, when I, when they knew that I was writing, I was like, well, why aren't you published yet? Why, you know, I'm like, Stop asking, you know, they don't get it. So it is, that is, having that tribe is so important. I, I totally agree with everything you've said. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Yeah. Um, What else am I going to, I have, didn't have time to look through my questions tonight. Oh, so the marketing, we mentioned marketing. What do you do for your marketing? Do you run Amazon ads or Facebook ads or anything like that? Do you rely on social media? Do you have a strategy? Um, Yeah, what does that look like? So I, I don't have a strategy yet because everything is still just like testing and learning since, you know, Death of a Fairy Tale was the first one. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. I mean, the biggest thing so far for me has been TikTok. I think that has been most of my my readers is where I found them. And then they went and found me on Instagram and it's just been great. 
but I do, you know, I'm playing with Amazon ads and seeing what works and what doesn't, um, trying to learn those. And then I do have some running and I'll turn them on and off just trying to see what works. I mean, I do sell some books on there. Um, I did do a book bub ad the day death of fairy tale came out. Yeah. It wasn't a featured deal. It was the new releases, um, which is different. It's not a new alert really. I don't know. They got a bunch of different ones, but it was, it was supposed to be pretty big, but I still attribute more of my good release to TikTok than I do to BookBub yeah. so far. So, yeah. yeah, those BookBub prices make me nervous. And I know authors who have had success on them. And actually, I don't know if you know um, Stella Berry. She's a cozy mystery author. And she ran quite a clever campaign where she had the book in Fussy Librarian, read see a few other places and then all built towards her book bub and she doubled her money that she invested um but it's quite a big underlay if you're not sure you're going to get that back and I've always kind of like every time I've put out a big outlay for something I've never reaped the rewards um and like you TikTok has definitely been the best place for me um my newest book I launched since I've been on TikTok and that hit the seller lists you know in the first two months which is incredible. Um, obviously, now it's back in the millions somewhere. But but for those two months, it was amazing. And that wouldn't have happened without BookTok. So it's just such an amazing platform where readers and authors can come together and, and share that. And I love seeing how there are so many readers now saying, I'm only reading indie books. Indie books are great because they defy genre they have these mashups they don't have the rules that you know traditionally published books do and that there's so much more available um which is also exciting for us as as authors to to have that so yeah definitely um right we've got to the part in the interview where we go for the fun questions um as a writer what would you choose as your spirit animal hmm that's a good question does it have to be a real animal (laughs) no no it can be mythical it can be anything you want yeah i think i would choose okay so i do have this other the book out it's a collection of short stories that was published by a very small press in the uk and i have no control over it i can't like market it or anything unfortunately so now it just kind of sits on amazon But I created these little things, and it's inspired by these guys. They're called Poros. Oh, And I have, they're called uh, Gibbets in my Eve of Anarchy book. But they basically just eat discarded magic, and they're just hungry all the time. So I think this would be my spirit animal. Because, like, if I, I just love eating, and if I could eat magic and just, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I love that they eat discarded magic. That's such a cool concept. Um, That's that's amazing. I I like that a lot. How many do you have? Of uh, in the book or because they're well, just little... yeah. But no, in real life, have you? Did you make them? So no, these are actually from a video game. The original. Um, I stole the idea from a, a, a video game and then like renamed them. And yeah. they don't in the video game. They don't eat discarded magic or anything. Yeah. They're just these little things that bounce around like wow. in the background. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that idea. That's fantastic. Um, Okay. If you could only drink one drink and eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? This does not have to be a healthy decision. You are allowed to give in to your guilty pleasures here. Hmm. I'm going to have to say iced coffee and a burrito. (laughs) I like it. It goes well together, especially in Especially in your neck of the woods, that's quite a common thing, isn't it? Yeah. It is, Lovely. yeah. Uh, okay, what is your favorite color? Orange. Orange, that's quite rare. My son's favorite color is orange. Um, I love it, yeah. Why? Because it's super bright, I think. Yeah. I we, My husband's favorite color is purple, so we had orange and purple at our wedding. And nobody believed us that it would look good together it looked great I together i bet it looked very elegant actually um i can imagine that yeah wow that's incredible uh have you got any pets uh yeah we have two guinea pigs because um i don't want to deal with cleaning up after a dog or a cat while i have kids so 
<laughs> but do you not have to clean out their cages like once a week or something? Yeah. Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. I think, so. see, I have a dog and I think I'd rather have that than, a, well, I don't know. It just depends, doesn't it? It does. Okay. Yeah, do. here's the, yeah, here's the big question. This depends on whether you get ejected from your chair or not. Let's see what your answer is. Are you Marvel or DC? Marvel. Okay, you're right. You're allowed. You're allowed to stay. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, I'm a huge. Do you have a favorite superhero? Um, I don't think so. Okay. What about you? Well, Who's your traditionally, favorite? I've always been a Spider-Man. And Tobey Maguire was always my Peter Parker. And then I watched, <clears throat> we watched all the Spider-Man movies with my nine-year-old son. And we kind of said, all right, who do we like? Do we like Tobey Maguire? Do we like Andrew Garfield? Or do we like Tom Holland? You know, and because he'd, yeah. he'd only really known Tom Holland. And I was like, Tom Holland is not Spider-Man. Let me show you the real Spider-Man, you know. But having watched all of them again, I, I do love them. And then having, we went to the movies to watch the newest one and all three of them are in it. It was like, it's like superhero porn for me because I had all my Spider-Mans in the same movie. It was fantastic. Um, but so Spider-Man, yeah, he's always been my favorite, even before there were movies. Um, but I will say for DC, I think Aquaman has definitely got a pull there because Jason Momoa can, yeah, yeah, do, do that for me. So, okay, moving on. <laughs> Um, all right. What three books would you take to a desert island or give to, give to an alien? It can be a different answer. Uh, probably And the Mountains Echoed by Khaled Hosseini would be one of them. Uh, and then probably, I don't know if this counts as one, but the Lord of the Rings trilogy would yeah, be. Yeah, that's fine. You can take a series as one. That's fine. I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then, gosh, I don't know. Let's see, the third one. Okay, look at my bookshelf. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I got to throw a YA one in there just because I love YA. So I'll say the uh, Ash Princess trilogy. Oh, yeah. Good, good, good. And what do you think an alien would, what do you think we should give aliens to read? Uh, also, And the Mountains Echoed. Okay. And... Ooh. Yeah, I don't know. I, can't, I don't know what beyond that. I I say that one because that one jumps like all around the world with a bunch of different characters in really yeah. different situations. So they would learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the point, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe something anti-war or anti-invasion. I don't know. <laughs> it might be helpful. Okay. Your last question. Do you have any talents that would help you survive the Hunger Games? I uh, only thing would be, yeah, probably figuring out strategies would be my talent because of how many escape rooms I've done. Ah, oh, yeah. So if there's any yes. clues left for me anywhere, I, I would be good at finding those for sure. I bet you, like in the second one where they've got the clock, I bet you would be figuring that out quite quickly, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm on your team because I'm a dead weight, so I can swim, but that's not very helpful on the first one. So, um, yeah, there we go. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and to get to know more about you and being an author and your book. Uh, and I can't wait to read more and hear about the rest of your journey. So do come back and chat to me sometime. Um, and I will let you get on with your day. And I wish you the best of luck. I cannot wait to hear more. Thank you so much and reaching yeah. out and talking. This has been so fun. So thank really you. Fun. I love I love learning about other people's journeys and you know, connecting and all of that. So um it's great fun. Really great fun. But I will let you get on with your day and uh hopefully not get any more sunburns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye. That was Emily Fluke. If you are interested in being on my show, if you'd like to be interviewed as an author, blogger, cover artist, whatever you are, do sign up to the Google form. Just swipe right and follow the arrows and you will find it. 
Uh, and until then, I urge you to check out her book, The Death of a Fairy Tale. It sounds absolutely amazing, right up my street. And I have started reading it. And it is funny, funny, funny uh, as well. So check it out. And I hope to see you soon.